Well, let me say good evening to you. It is now 624. It's almost 625. We're about to start our Bible study, which hopefully will begin promptly at 630 p.m. Uh, for those that have uh, attend with us regularly and are friends with this ministry, you know that what we do is we come on a few moments earlier just to give us an opportunity to meet each other, to greet each other, to say hello from time to time, give our coffee check-in to see what brand of coffee someone is drinking on in the afternoon or even in the morning. That way we don't just haphazardly just stumble or rush into the presence of God and learning his word. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. I'm the pastor of New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for 14 years. And uh, if everything goes well, uh, it'll be 15 years on this Sunday. Looking forward to having my good friend, Pastor Timms, my co-laborer in the gospel, Pastor Timms, uh, and New Hope come to share with us. Uh, Lord knows how I miss him. He's just a jewel, certainly a jewel to New Hope because he certainly was a jewel to New Hebron. And uh, good evening, Pastor uh, Tim. I didn't see you there. Pastor Tim, good evening to you. Reverend and Sister Austin, God bless you as well. Uh, to Sister Waller. Now, Sister Waller, I don't mean to say this in front of everybody. Somebody told me you weren't feeling well. And I don't know if we gave you permission to not feel well. So kind of mad at you. I'm going to call you and make sure you're okay, but I'm still going to call you and mess with you too. Uh, but to Sister Nia James, God bless you and everyone else. Tonight, we're going to have a good lesson. All of the lessons from God's Word are good, but tonight we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verses 22 to 27. Philippians chapter 2, verses 22 to 27. So I want us to go ahead and get our Bibles prepared, get ourselves ready. Uh, I've got my outline and my Bible in front of me. I am rested, I am ready, I am prepared, and I cannot wait to get started with the lesson for tonight. I want to go ahead and say this to you that I've really missed you all this past Sunday. It was awkward for me doing a pre-recorded lesson and ran into a couple of roadblocks to where initially I was going to do the Sunday school lesson and the morning sermon. Uh, didn't quite feel comfortable doing both of them. So we just did the morning Sunday school lesson, but I, I did miss all of you. Uh, I had an obligation to make sure I got my son back to college and I wanted to do that. I don't want my son to grow up or my daughters to grow up and say, well, my daddy couldn't do this and couldn't do that because he was a preacher. I'm like, no, I, I think family needs to be taken care of, you know, because even the Bible says, if a man can't take care of his own house, how can he care for the house of God? So I wanted to use what we had, uh, the means we had available to get done what we were able to get done. So we were able to make it work. You know, everything went well. Uh, and like I said, I enjoyed that time with my son. It was over a lot quicker than expected. But nonetheless, you know, he's, he's a big boy now. He's a big boy now. Yeah, Lord have mercy. I can go ahead and say this. My food bill is about to go down. My light bill is about to go down. And when I clean the house in the morning before I go to work, guess what, y'all? When I come back home, the house is still clean. Lord have mercy. No dishes, no cups, no clothes thrown everywhere. The house is just clean. Boy, that's something the way that works, isn't it? So nonetheless, that's just my experience. Lord knows I miss my son, and I want him to grow and become independent. But I don't know. When you get to looking at this light bill, because TVs are on all day and all night. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so... Deacon and Sister Davis, God bless you to all of you, to the Tims family, uh, Brother Tims and Sister Tims. God bless you also. Once again, Philippians chapter 2, verses 22 to 27 is where we're going to be tonight. It is almost 630. Sister Verdi Davis, bless you. It is almost 630, and I want to be respectful of our time. So that's why we do come on early. So we can have these few moments just to greet and say hello to everyone, get a few announcements, and then we'll go ahead with our lesson. Want to reiterate again, again, 
Lord willing, on this Sunday, the third Sunday, uh, will be the 15-year anniversary for me at New Hebron. And Lord knows I am humbled and thankful. This one just seems a little different to me. They're all wonderful, but this one just for some reason stands out in my heart and my mind. In our Sunday school lesson, our own chairman, Deacon Marcus Davis, is going to be teaching the Sunday school lesson. For those of you that know him, you certainly know he's going to come and to share God's word and tell you what the book says. For those of you that may not be familiar with him, when you hear him and follow along with him in the Bible, you will never forget him. And once again, at 1045, our worship service will begin. And my good friend and brother in Christ, Pastor Tims and his family and the New Hope Church family is going to be with us to share uh, in those festivities that morning. Pastor Tims, I appreciate you coming in the morning. I know that's no small feat, but I certainly appreciate you making time to come and to be with us. So nonetheless, we've made it to 630. If you can pause what you're doing just for a moment, let's have a word of prayer. And then we're going to go into God's word this morning. This evening, excuse me. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for being kind. Thank you for bringing us through a long day. Thank you for helping us to navigate the storms of, that come with living in a fallen world. Some of us were at work. Others were retired and relaxing. Some were in the hospital checking on family. But Father, we just ask you right now, all of our successes and all of our needs, if we can move them to the side, if just for a moment, help us to fully concentrate on your word, open our heart, our mind, open our understanding, open your word up so that we can make it, so that we can understand it. I pray that you can use me to this end, to where you can receive all of the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. So God bless you. Let's go ahead and turn there. Uh, I, I want to ask you all, uh, one of our members, longtime members, is uh, she's ill. Um, Sister Joyce Cleveland, she's a member of New Hebron. Uh, she's ill. She's uh, been taken to the hospital as of yesterday. So please remember her in your prayers. Many of the members of New Hebron know who I'm talking about. Please remember, Sister Joyce Cleveland, in your prayers. I don't ever feel comfortable telling what someone's medical issue is. I feel that that's a personal issue that they can share to whom they so desire to do so. And if I were to tell you, many of us couldn't fix it anyway. But we can take it to a God that sits high and looks low. So pray for Sister Joyce Cleveland and her family, Sister Turner and all the others. Keep them lifted in prayer as she kind of deals with her medical issues. Because remember, it is her time this time. We just never know. It could be our time next time. So I wanted to share that with you, uh, to all of you. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 22 to 27. We pick up midstream. I'm going to go back to verses... Uh, I'll start at some earlier verses as we flow into verses 22, but our reading will begin at Philippians 2, verse 22. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he has ministered, and, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick for indeed he was sick nigh or close unto death but God had mercy on him and not on him only but me also lest I have sorrow upon sorrow amen these are going to serve as our verses our this passage our text for tonight and so because I, I say this all the time, at the risk of repeating myself, 
when it comes to real estate, the three words that pop up is location, location, location. When it comes to interpreting, uh, interpreting the Bible, the three words that pop up are context, context, context. So if you happen to not be with us a week ago, we were in verses 16 to 21. And in these verses, this is Paul writing to the Philippians. And Paul got to a point in verse 19 to where Paul let them know, I'm going to be sending Timothy to you. Is his uh, Timotheus, which is Timothy to you. He said that I also may be of good comfort when I know of your state. The, the understanding is I'm going to send Timothy to check on you. I'm in Rome on a house arrest, chained to the foot of a Roman soldier. They switch him out every so many hours with a fresh body. These are members of the Praetorian Guard. These are the elite soldiers that watch Caesar himself. So I can't come to you, but I'm going to send Timothy to you, verse 19. And here's why in verse 20, he says, here's why I'm going to send him to you. For I have no man who is like-minded who would just naturally care for your state. He said, I'm sending Timothy to you. Don't be alarmed. Don't be on guard. He's like-minded. He has the same heart for God that I have for God. And he's not someone that will fleece the flock. He's not someone that will feed on the flock. He's somebody that will feed the flock of God. He will naturally care for your state, for your well-being. And then the last two verses in our lesson for last week, he said, for all seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to make sure I get that right. The last verse, verse 21, for all seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, people, at the risk of sounding negative and pessimistic, I have to warn you, there are individuals that stand behind that sacred desk, that say prayers at altar call, that have nice suits and drive a Cadillac and a nice watch on and French cuff shirts with glittery French you know, cufflinks. There are men that stand behind that sacred desk and still seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ, that they do not naturally care for your state. Lord, uh, on the third Sunday of last month, we had a baptism. We had two people we baptized. And that morning's message, I was laying out in our sermon series, the need to grow. And I talked about how my heart goes out to a church that is vacant. And the three things I'm pointing out from Acts chapter 1, that church needs to be a praying church. As they prayed for who would be the 12th disciple, the 12th apostle, we could say. And the lot fell on Matthias. And in their prayer, they said, Lord, show us who you have already chosen because you know everything. We talked about how you have to be careful for selfish, ambitious men. We looked at Peter and John who went with their mother. Give my two sons Seats of honor, one at your left and one at your right. Well, are they going to be able to drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? Yeah, they can do it. No, they can't. She wanted her son to have special seats beside Jesus, the high seats, the executive corner office when Jesus comes into his glory. That is ambition. That is selfish ambition. That is desiring to be seen, to be heard, to have glory rest upon you. And the last point I made was from Acts chapter 6. And those men in the text were not deacons per se, but they certainly fulfilled the role because a church needs to have a strong deacon ministry. You don't need to just have a warm body. Just because a man comes to church once every three months, you don't make him a deacon. Just because he says a prayer and he carries a Bible. No, 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 no. Because when the church does not have a shepherd, you need to have some men that stand on God's word, that will do what is right, even though it is unpopular, that will do what God's word says, even if they come under criticism, that will protect the church until God sends them who he wants them to have. Because 
Paul just told us in verse number 20 of this current chapter, I have nobody else that's like-minded except for Timothy. Timothy will naturally take care of you, verse 21, because there are so many men out there that are charlatans masquerading as lovers of God's people, and they seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say this as we flow into verse 22, last example, because this cannot be underemphasized. I saw a clip of a pastor, Kansas City, Kansas, somewhere anyway, was going off on the church because they didn't do this for him. They didn't buy this for him. And to have him say that was obviously materialistic, selfish, certainly had nothing to do with caring for them. He was talking about them caring for him materially. But what was even worse was he was lauded with amens. And I'm like, look, I said to myself, Lord, I am mature enough now in the faith. I am bold enough now as a Christian that I know I would have got my hat, got my jacket, escorted my family right out the door in the middle of it. I know it. I, I, or if I was in the pulpit, I ain't waving a finger, got to go. See you later. My point is, the same thing Paul was speaking about then in the first century, the same thing that's going on now. God's word is not just written for these Philippian Christians. That's a colony of Rome, some antiquated book that can't help you. It is valid even right now. Paul makes this assertion of these types of men. We see an example of in 2022. It still goes on. And then in verse 22, as we get to our current passage for tonight. But you know the proof of him, still talking about Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Notice the word he uses in the King James Version, verse 22, proof of him. In the New American Standard Bible, that phrase is rendered proven worth. It's one word in the Greek, and it means trial. It means to be tested. And what Paul is saying about Timothy, who he's going to send to these Philippian Christians to check on them, he's saying that Timothy has proven character. Timothy has character that has been tested, that has gone through trials. He's saying Timothy is suitable to be able to serve, help, assist, and minister to their needs. This is Paul's way of saying to the Philippians, but you know, you have seen his credentials. You have seen him under pressure. You have seen that Timothy is not a novice. Not somebody who heard a song and chords from the organ and they felt emotional and they got goosebumps and they said, God must be calling me to preach. And besides, people have been saying, I look like a preacher. I walk like a preacher. I dress like a preacher. I sing like a preacher should sing. In people's eyes, I must be being called to preach. And that person jumps into the pulpit. And guess what? When the trials and the fire and the pressure gets on, they wilt under the pressure. The Greek word that Paul uses for the word proof, it's also used for testing of precious metals. These precious metal, the gold ore, the silver ore in its raw state, it goes through the fire and guess what? It's able to handle the test and the pressure. Now, first of all, I wanna say this, this brings about some application that yes, as Christians, yes, as Christian servant leaders, we will be tested. Tested because we live in a fallen world. Tested because ministry is a people business. And sometimes the people that you serve alongside or sometimes the people that you actually have to serve themselves are at different 
areas in their spiritual growth. Test it because Satan will make sure that he does whatever he can, whenever he can, as often as he can to try to bring you down. And if you think the testing is just in the pulpit, you're fooling yourself. The testing is not just in the pulpit. It's not just for the deacon. It's not just for the Sunday school teacher. The testing that we are all to undergo is for everyone. Now, in context, Paul is speaking to these Christians about Timothy, who's going to come. You have seen, you are aware, you know the proof of him. He has been tested. And you've seen him come out on the other side with flying colors. This is not someone who will get mad at a decision that doesn't go in the way they want it and they will leave. This is not the church member who will come to a church meeting and the church says we're going to buy a new copier and they say we don't want a copier. Why buy a copier? And they don't like it and they stay and cause trouble. This is not someone who goes through the fire and affliction that is associated in many times, not all the time, but there will be times that the trials and affliction associated with leadership bring upon you and they're quick to quit. Every December, they finna quit. Every year when it's almost, yeah, this is my last year, I can't take it no more. Oh, I can't take it. I'm done, I'm done. No, 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 no. This is someone who's been tested and come through with flying colors because you know that they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You can survive the test because you know that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Because you know that God will stand with you, stand for you. And guess what? He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Because you know too much about God. You're too close to God. You've had too many experiences from what his word says and you tried it and it worked out. You've done that too many times to think that Satan is going to get the victory. That the pressure from this world is going to wipe you out. No, no. That process is not just for the Timothys in the pulpit. That process is for everyone, every Christian. You're going to go through it. There, there's nothing that saddens me more is when I see people that are just jewels to the church and the pressure gets on them and they didn't realize that all of these other things are associated with what they're going through and they're like, I didn't sign up for this. And, and, and you can see it, almost see it in their eyes. You can almost discern and tell, yeah, that, that pressure getting heavy. Now, now let's be clear. Lord knows that pressure hits on everybody. I can tell you stories about myself. That, that, that pressure, that pressure gets you now. True. That's why revival is important. You see, revival is not just for the wicked, where your character is marred and shaped and getting off track. Yeah, it's for that. But revival is also for the weak, to where you get weary sometimes, to where you get tired. You need to be refreshed. You need to be renewed. You need to be restored. I, I, I need a word from the Lord. I need my heart. And revival doesn't have to just be you call some preacher in from 50 miles away. No, you can have it in your own home because when the testing and the weight and the pressure gets heavy, guess what? You can steal away, turn your TV off, close your bedroom door, get down on the side of your bed. As a matter of fact, leave your bedroom door open. Let your children see you praying. Let them see you in there crying and calling out to the Lord. You ain't got to close your door. Get on your knees and let them hear and see. This is how mama got the victory. This is how daddy keeps going. This is how they keep dealing with all of these pressures. Oh, this is not, I don't just see them praying at church. No, I see my daddy. 
I see my mother. I see my spouse, my loved one on their knees at home. Lord, I can't take it. Lord, I need you. Just call out to them. All of us are going to be tested. And guess what? Our proven worth will be shown. Y yes, we will. The runner, the Olympic runner, the track runner, he tests his speed. The boat maker, he don't just put the boat together and puts it on the market. No, he puts the boat on the water and tests the boat, the flotation of his device. The car buyer, guess what you do? You don't always just take their word for it. Even a brand new car can have clicks and ticks and smoking and knocking noises. So the car buyer will test drive the car. And when it comes to Christians, not just Christian leaders, although Paul is speaking of Timothy, his proof, you know the proven worth of him, the trials and tests that he's been through, you've seen him go through it and come out shining like gold. The Christian will be tested as well for weakness and for strength. God does that to us. God will do it or God will allow it so that we can come forth, as Job said, like gold. So Paul, in verse 22, he said, you know, you've seen, you've witnessed, your eyes have been on Timothy. You know the proof of him. Guess what, Christians? You're going to be watched. And guess what, Christians? They're supposed to watch you. <laughs> you know the proof of him. Just like a son that's with his father. You have seen Timothy faithfully, continually serving with me in the gospel. Timothy does not have a quick to quit bone in his body. He's in there for the long haul. And I thank the Lord for the members of anybody's church, New Hebrew and every other church. I thank the Lord for those members that are in there for the long haul. That's one thing, and I'm not going to stay on this verse too much longer, but that's one thing that COVID, in my estimation, has done. In some particular ways, it has separated the sincere and genuine from the ones who are not. Because if you don't really have a heart for the Lord, this pandemic has exposed you really wasn't. No, no, no. I'm not saying put your health at risk. Those who have mitigating factors and depending on your age and health. I'm not saying because you don't come to church as somebody else. I'm not saying that. Mm -mm. I didn't like it when people tried that with me telling me you must not have any faith. Well, why not? Well, because you ain't had church. What, 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 come on, slow down now. Slow down. No, no, no. I got just as much faith not having church certain times in the pandemic as I have when it's a snow day, as I have when it's a tornado warning. You know, so I'm not saying that in a way this is some who comes to church more than whoever during the pandemic, so they must have more faith than you. Not saying that. But in many ways, this pandemic has brought to light, brought to the surface that there are some people that really didn't want to, they really just wanted to flirt with God. They wasn't really in love with him. Testing the proof of him, the proving worth. He said, you know it, you've seen it, you've been made aware, you've seen that this person I'm sending you, he's no stranger to service. He's no stranger to getting his hands dirty. He doesn't mind getting involved. Him, therefore, verse 23 and 24, him, therefore, I hope to send presently so as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Paul is not only expecting to send Timothy to them, but he's also saying that I'm confident that I'll be there with you as well. This plays on what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. As Paul talks about his 
bonds in the gospel, how he set for defense on the gospel, how people are talking about him and preaching about him while he's going through his ordeal. And in Philippians 1 and verse 19, he says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's saying, listen, let me tell y'all something right now. If you think I'm resting my hopes on the Roman judicial system, if you think I'm putting my hopes into the good lawyer skills that I may have against whomever is going to go against me as I go through this house arrest situation, I'm not putting my hopes in Rome. I'm not putting my hopes in the Roman judicial system. Let's translate and bring it up to speed. I'm not putting my hopes in my job. I'm not putting my hopes and my comfort doesn't come from my home. My identity and peace and comfort and trust and hopes and well-being doesn't come from anything or anyone else except for the Lord. Now, let me say this to you people. Personal question, you don't have to answer. Who do you trust in? Oh, Lord have mercy. Who do you trust? Somebody going to say, I trust in the Lord. Okay. The Lord that you don't pray to regularly. The Lord that you don't read about in the word. Because the Bible is just meant to make you go to sleep at night. The, the Lord that you don't think is worthy of worship. The Lord that you won't click a button and look at on your phone to be a part of a live stream Bible study. That's who you trusted in. It doesn't seem like you even know too much about him as I rhetorically speak these things and say these things. Listen, my hope, my trust is in the Lord. It is good to have confidants, people who are like-minded that you can confide in, to call a brother or a sister and say, brother, man, and just bear your heart to him. Somebody that you can say, man, this is what I'm going through. To have a godly parent that you can call mama, mama, poof, daddy, daddy, here's what I'm going through. To have a godly spouse. Ooh, Lord have mercy. I've been reading the book of Proverbs in the morning. It talks about when you have a godly spouse, your heart trusts safely in her. Somebody you can just talk to and say, baby, I'm just going through it. Talk to your man. Talk to your wife. Talk to your husband. Oh, Lord, it's just so. The, the, these are comforts, graces, I believe, that God puts in our lives. But your comfort, your trust, your hope better not be in a person. Mm, 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 mm. L listen, there are certain people who the level of anxiety and the level of mental anguish and trauma rises to a level to where they need to see somebody with a degree. They, they, they need to talk to some. They're having thoughts that they just shouldn't have. They have a sadness that seems to be on steroid and is lingering and lingering and lingering. They may need to see, I guess, a therapist or a psychiatrist. Nothing in the world wrong with that. No more than going to the doctor when you have a fractured bone. Listen, you, you may need to. But if your hopes, if your peace is only derived from speaking to Dr. So-and-so or mama or daddy or a pastor or a deacon, if your peace and hope come from these people and not the Lord, let me just tell you, you're setting yourself up for a big fail. There is no one that can handle your situation like the Lord can handle your situation. From April, May, June, and July, four months, I had a serious issue that I was going through. Now, now. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is for two reasons. The first reason is, well, it's personal and it's not your business. Amen. The second reason is, well, it's personal and it's not your business. I think of a third reason. The third reason is, see reason one and reason two. But let me tell you, 
I had a situation to where it was to the point I was like, can't nobody fix this but God. Can't, mm -mm. No, can't nobody fix this but the Lord. No, can't nobody fix this. Ain't no sense making these cryptic posts. Ain't no sense blabbering your heart out to some. Can't nobody fix this but the Lord. And when you put your hope in God, talk to me if you can. And when you know you didn't talk to nobody but the Lord about it. And you pray and you looked in the word and you prayed and you say, Lord, I see what your word says. And I see what I'm going through. And I don't know how what's in this book is going to affect what I'm going through. But I just believe it. And when God brings you through it, whoo, Lord, you can't help but say, Lord, thank you. You, you, you. Listen, you can't. Sometimes God allows and orchestrates situations to where mama can't help you this time. No, no, no. Mm -mm. The therapist can't get you out of this. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. But the so-and-so can't help you. But when you talk to God about it, whoo, and you spend that time with the Lord, and when God says enough, and things just get to click and click and click, you're like, there ain't nobody but God. L -l -l Listen, on a corporate level, New Hebrew, don't we know what that's like? <laughs> New Hebrew, talk back to me if you can. The guests and the visitors and friends, they don't know, but New Hebrew, don't we know what God can do? Have we not experienced when God says enough, it's time to bless you. When God does it, when God removes the obstacle, when God takes away the pain, when God does that, you better not be saying, thank you, pastor, thank you, deacon, or uh, thank you, so, no, no, no. You better say, thank you, Lord. And so when your hope, like Paul's saying, when your trust is in him, not the judicial system. Listen, thank you for skilled lawyers. Thank you for a judge with a soft heart. But, Lord, it was only you. It was nobody but you that did that. That's why Paul says in verse 24, yeah, Timothy, I'm going to send him. Yeah, I trust I'm going to come also. But I'm trusting that these things will happen because I trust in the Lord. The Lord. Because there's only one. <laughs> See, y'all going gonna to make me do it. Because I wasn't live with you Sunday morning, I got to make up now. Listen, there's only one. Mm. And the God that we serve sits high and it looks low. Mm, mm, mm. So he said, listen, that's who my trust is in. I have my hope, my trust in nobody but the Lord. Can't nobody do it. That's my Aunt Rosetta, like Jesus can. Amen. Verse number 25. He says, yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, companion in labor, Fellow soldier, but you're a messenger. And he that ministered to my wants. Lord have mercy. Epaphroditus was the messenger assigned individual sent from Philippi with the offering to give to Paul. It was some goods. We don't know specifically what it was, but it was beneficial to Paul. He was the messenger sent on behalf of the church at Philippi to Paul. And what happened is he is now being sent back to Philippi. And guess what he has with him? He has this letter called the book of Philippians. He has this letter to the Philippians. Remember how this Bible study began? Philippians is a thank you note. Philippians is a reply text. Thank you so much for the good gifts. Thank you so much for remembering me when I was down. And oh yeah, this part of the letter, Epaphroditus, he's going to be all right. And Epaphroditus, his name comes from a Greek goddess, uh, a mythical Greek goddess, Aphrodite. Aphrodite. And this is a very good indication to us that he was born to Gentile parents, that he was not a Jew. 
A Jew would not normally name their child, not a good Jew. They wouldn't name their child after a Greek, false, idol, mythical God. You know, you may have a whole bunch of names like Mary, Sarah, but you won't have any Epaphroditus, any names after Greek gods. So how is this portion of Philippians instructive to us? Well, here's how it is. As Epaphroditus, we can safely assume, is not a Jew. He still is being used by the God of the Jews. Now, here's what I mean. Because some Jews were under the impression that we're Jews, we're the chosen race, we're the special, y'all need to bow down to us. No, God doesn't see it that way. No, not at all. God does not discriminate to whom he uses. Listen, he just wants the person that he does use to surrender to him. The only qualification God wants for you to be used is to be willing. Jew, Gentile, black, white, Native American, Asian, Indian, Russian, German, French, man, woman. Here's another one. Boy, or a girl. We need to break away from this. The only thing time I can be serious with God is when I get some silver in my beard. No, you can be serious for God as a college student. You can be serious for God as a teenager. You can be serious for God in the 10th grade, 8th grade. You can be whenever you are willing, God says, I'm able. So we see Epaphroditus here and look at how he's described. My brother, He's a brother in Christ, companion in labor, a co-laborer with me. And he also says, fellow soldier, fighting partner. It, it, it's kind of used figuratively in this way, not literal fights, but to speak about their, their commonality or fellowship when it comes to conflicts, when it comes to having victory for God, when it comes to discipling others for Christ. He's somebody that has been there, but he's your messenger, meaning you all selected him and chose him probably for these characteristics and sent him to me with your love gift. And he that is someone that ministered to my wants, he assisted me. What you guys sent to him, it got to me, and he served. He didn't mind doing these things. So Epaphroditus is someone that represents the everyday Christian. Guess what? God can use you too. It, whenever you are willing God say, that's when you're able, or when I'm able to use you. God can, and God will use you if you allow him. It is really, in my estimation, a modern-day miracle that God gets the successes, the victories, the joy in the church with only a fraction of people who are willing to be used by him. You may have a whole bunch of names on the roll per se, but sad to say you don't always have all of those people fully engaged in what the service or what the church is involved in. And the fact that God can use a remnant of people to bring about the blessings, to bring about the service and the ministry that he does, it's a modern day miracle. If you just give me 50 people that are willing to surrender to the Lord, we can put to shame a thousand who are not. And Epaphroditus is someone that could be a champion for that cause. And Paul here is saying, Epaphroditus got to me. He compliments and lays out his character. And he says that he did minister to my wants. Last two verses, verses 26 and 27. For he longed after you all, still talking about Epaphroditus, and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. Verse 27, Paul confirms, yeah, he was sick. Indeed, he was sick. He was so sick, he was close to death. 
but God. <laughs> there it is right there. God. Not, not, not Dr. Luke. Mm-hmm. Stay with me. Not the attending physicians in Rome. Mm -mm. God had mercy on him. And guess what? The mercy that God had, his cup of mercy for Epaphroditus overflowed. And I was the saucer that caught the overflow because not just him only, but also me. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. This is a reference to Paul confirming that Epaphroditus was sick and he almost died. But God brought him back to health. Now, now stay with me. We don't know because the text doesn't say how God did that. Let me give you a very good Bible study note where scripture is silent. We must be silent. Let's not try to add in or eisegete the text. No, no, no. Did God do this miraculously? Or did God do this through normal means? Did God do this through normal means and he still sped up the recovery process? We don't know. But whether it was done in either case, the glory still goes to God. So if we have ailments and the doctor gives you bad news and you go back for another checkup and mysteriously after your prayers, whatever they thought they saw has now been removed, is erased, you better give God the glory. Or if you have the same scenario and the doctor prescribes you to eat a certain food or stop eating a certain food and take this one little medication here, and then in six weeks you'll be better. Still give God the glory. Or if they give you that same scenario and give you that medicine, and they say it should be six weeks, but God bless you to happen, it happens to you in two weeks. Give God the glory. Because all roads begin and end with him. Who is it that gave the doctor the mind to put together ingredients to make um, some kind of appeal that you can take to lower your blood pressure? Who is it that gave the scientist the mind to put together a machine where they can even look inside your body and take an x-ray to see what's happening inside of you? That, listen, all of the glory goes to the Lord. He said God had mercy on him. It is a mercy that God would do these things. And listen, and he said not just to him, but God had mercy on me also because if it was not for God, God's mercy, I would have sorrow upon sorrow. I would be sad because of my imprisonment, my house arrest. I would be sad because I'm trusting God, but still there's the impending situation with my trial. I would be sad because I'm missing all of these Philippians. I want to see you. I'm so glad y'all have checked on me. I'm glad y'all, as we can say, put money on my books. But after all of that, if Epaphroditus would have died, that's what he means. It would have been sorrow on top of sorrow. And Paul said, if these things would have taken place and then Epaphroditus would have died. Well, listen, let me tell you something right now. That, that would have been so much worse for me. So let me, let me close by saying this. If you are a Christian and you're hearing these principles and themes, trust in the Lord, God can use anyone as long as you're willing. Who is your hopes in? Who do you get your confidence from? You know, all these things. And you're like trying to make sense of it all. Let, let, let me say to you this, that these are principles from God's word that are true and tested. God bless you, Deacon Smith. These are true and tested principles from God's word. And as we see these mandates and statutes, and commands even, as Christians, we are obliged 
we are commanded to obey. We shouldn't put our trust in men. Thank you for the seatbelt. But the seatbelt is not my the one that kept me from the wreck. That's the Lord. People have died stepping outside the shower and slipping and breaking their head. Trust in the Lord. So we, we, we're to implement them. If you're someone that's not a Christian and you're just trying to get it together, you, you understand these principles. But you've tried and it don't work. You've tried and it don't work. I tried to be humble. I tried to trust in God. I'm not a Christian, but I'm, I'm morally good. I don't steal money from my job. I don't rob people. Friend, for you to implement these principles and you're not a Christian is not just hard. It's impossible. The, the, there's no way someone who is not filled with the presence of God's spirit will be able to take what God's word says and have any lasting or lingering effect in your life. That, that I've told people, if all you do, if you have a drinking problem, if some kind of way you begin to manage your alcohol consumption and you don't drink anymore, but you never accept Christ, well, that just means you're going to hell sober now. You see, if you are not a Christian and you read this or you hear this stream and you see this Bible study and you're wondering, trying to make sense of it all, well, to some degree, the natural man, that's Paul's description of someone who's not a Christian, the natural man does not truly understand or discern the spiritual things of God. They're foolishness to him. To show kindness to someone that's not kind to you is not square with how the culture works. But what happens is when you read the scriptural account, a story of a man named Jesus who was not just a man. He is God's only begotten son that took on human form. He's the only person in that way we can say who was human but yet was perfect he gave his life on calvary's cross fulfilling all of the old testament requirements and when he hung on the cross god poured out his judgment for the sins of humanity past present and future on jesus Jesus paid for the sins of all of us. Now, that doesn't mean we have a free way to go do wrong. Well, of course not. He didn't free us for us to go run back into sin again. No. But that does mean that in your fight for sin, it doesn't mean you're sinless, but it does mean that you sin less and less and less of the time. Because when you believe that Jesus literally lived, he literally died, he literally rose from the grave, he went through the pain and shame and sorrow of death, and he did that for me, and it humbles you and makes you want to repent, to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I can't believe you gave me so great a gift, and this is the way I've been repaying you by the way I'm living. <clears throat> When you believe what the Bible says about Christ dying for our sins on faith, and then you accept the free gift of salvation that's given to you by grace, you then instantly, when that happens, may not have goosebumps, may not have some warm, fuzzy feelings, you may not hear angels singing and see the Spirit descending and resting upon you like a gov, but Paul said you get what's called the earnest of the Spirit. The, the, the down of payment, God is saying, I'm going to give you my spirit as earnest, as a down payment, just to assure you, to let you know that not only are you getting this gift now, but there's a greater gift beyond the clouds one of these old days. Because when you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'm saying all of this because I want to make salvation plain. In my, my assumption, I'll say, there's too many people under the false hopes of salvation that are not Christian. They just heard a song, got goosebumps, and went down the aisle. No change in their life, no change in character. They still treat folks wrong. They still do the same stuff they've been doing for 30 years. 
No, no, no. Th th there's a change because when you truly have been born again and you get involved in stuff you shouldn't do, not that God has taken away our ability as Christians to sin. Mm -mm. No, no, we know better than that. But he has taken away our ability to rest in sin and like it like we used to. It just doesn't have the same allure. It just doesn't give you the same comfort. Yeah, you can do the same thing an unsaved person can do. You can hurt somebody the same way a gang member can hurt somebody. But there's somebody inside of you. You may not be in public. You may be in the ceiling fan in your bed. Just you all night long. But just won't let you be at ease like you used to be. That's one of the signs you've been twice born. And if you have not given your life to Christ, let me implore you. Let me beg you. Let me share with you, plead with you. Give yourself to him completely because time is winding up. Not many people wake up knowing that this is going to be their last day. And guess what? It doesn't do well, I'll say it this way. There's nothing we can do when that warm body has turned cold. You can say all the kind things you want to at some funeral service. You can call it a homegoing celebration. But if this individual has not confessed a hope in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there is no hope of heaven for that person. So let's just fix it on the front end. Let me extend what Christ extended to us over 2,000 years ago. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and you will find rest unto your souls. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. There is nothing that you have done that you can out -sin the grace of God. I don't care what the courts have said, I don't care what families have said. I don't care what friends and co-workers have said. You can never be so low that the grace of God can't get you. Let me tell you that now. I don't care how long you have sinned, how far you've gotten into the wilderness. You can't out sin the love and the grace of God. So let me encourage you today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like some will do. This is not just some old antiquated story by some old men written in the desert. This is God, not me, of course, but this is God's word that he has left on record that can be scientifically shown ahead of his time. Historically talks about places that still exist today that has given biblical facts. Even in the book of Job, Job explained what evaporation was. How the water goes to the clouds and the clouds fill up and rain comes down thousands of years ago before Ned Permy even knew what was going on. God's word can be trusted and the God of the word can be trusted as well. Let me encourage you to give your life to him. Please feel free to visit us at our church website, New Hebron LR for Little Rock. NewHebronLR.org. You can find a copy of all of our Bible study lessons, sermons, the church uh, um, doctrinal stands, just whatever you need. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. We love you. I appreciate all of you for your time tonight. I thank the Lord for you. And I think I'm going to shut it down here. This is a good point. So I pray that God keeps you safe. I hope that all of you enjoy the rest of your evening. To those of you who are experiencing the, the mountaintop of life, tell them thank you. Tell them thank you. To those of you who may be in the valley, let me tell you, trouble don't last always. David said it this way, I can look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Because all my help comes from the Lord that created the heavens and the earth. David is looking to the hills because he's in the valley. And all of us will find ourselves there at some time. So I pray God keeps you safe. I enjoyed myself tonight. I hope that you did too. I hope you have learned something that maybe you hadn't learned before or maybe have been refreshed on something that you have not gone over in some time. But nonetheless, in either case, we pray that God gets the glory. 
So God bless you, and I pray God keeps you safe till we meet again.